Good evening, everybody. That's a nice response. Thank you so much. I've been told I have a strict five minutes, so you know me. I love to talk. I'm going to have to move quickly. My name's Gary Jones. I'm president of Full Sail University, and welcome to The Fortress, one of 115 studios, sound stages, production facilities <gasps> that makes up Full Sail University, along with their 17,000 students and 70,000 graduates. On behalf of them, welcome, welcome. I also have the privilege, and I do mean privilege, of serving as the chairman of the Board of Trustees for the Florida chapter of the Nature Conservancy. This is where you applaud. Yes, what a great organization. So glad to have you with us today here at our venue at Full Sail, Lot, Full Sail Campus, one of our live venues. We are also live streaming tonight to 1.4 million people. So everybody have a little wave to all of our friends that are live streaming tonight. Thank you for joining us, everyone out there in Etherland. We're glad, glad, glad to have you. A couple of dignitaries, you're all dignitaries, but a couple of uh, our political leaders that are here tonight. Elizabeth Johnson's here representing Mayor Jerry Deming's office. Elizabeth, thank you for coming. Away, please, where are you? There you are. Please tell the mayor we love him. Todd Weaver, Winter Park City Councilman. Todd, would you please say howdy? Thanks for being here, good brother. Thank you for ser your service to our great town. Our great city, I should say. Awesome to have you. Um, why do I volunteer for the Nature Conservancy? I've been a volunteer for am I my ninth year now. And this is my first year as chairman of the board, which is a great privilege and a great call to duty. Um, I would love to spend the rest of the night telling you why I volunteer, but I'm going to sum it up in just two or three very brief statements. Impact. The Nature Conservancy works on four major pillars, tackling climate change, protecting the important lands and waters that we all, all life, depend upon, providing sustainable sources for food and water for an ever-growing population in this world, and helping to create resilient, healthy cities. Those are the four pillars that I think are so important for the world in which we live this day and age. Uh, secondly, Science, they use science as their basis for everything, not emotion. It makes for so much better decisions when it comes to how we build policy and how we do the good work of preserving these things. Third, they partner with anybody and everybody that makes sense. Governments, the federal and state government, other nonprofit organizations. They partner with hunters. They partner with tree, with timber uh, farmers, with regular farmers. I'm saying that all wrong, but you know what I mean. They partner with all the people, which is really all of us, that count on Mother Earth as a source of sustenance. And lastly, they have a global reach. They're all about scale. 70 countries, nine territories, and every state in the US has the Nature Conservancy with boots on the grounds doing the good work. Why the Panther Project is important tonight, we're focused on the, the ghost cat, right? The Florida Panther. Here's why. If you'll indulge me, I'm going to read the next three points so I can stay brief and on time. The Florida Panther is a symbol for a far-reaching protection program with great impact. An umbrella species, meaning because of the good work for the panther, so many other species, including us, benefit from preserving this network of life. So by protecting the panther, we're protecting a multitude of other creatures that need to live in this world and have a role in it. How about a, a quick shot of the nature? Oh, you've got it already. Thank you, guys. You're fast. The Nature Conservancy Magazine. As you can see, Carlton Ward's great work is on the cover of this month's issue. Is that a great photograph? Nice work, Carlton. Nice work, brother. Beautiful. Nature Conservancy's Magazine. 72,000 copies are distributed across the US, and hundreds of thousands of online readers partake of the information in this multi-award-winning magazine that deploys deep investigative journalism. And this issue highlights the Florida panther and why we should be protecting land on a large scale for it and other species. Now, the man of the hour, Carlton Ward, is in the house. Carlton, what a privilege to have you. Carlton Ward Jr. is an eighth-generation Floridian. How about that, Christy? Eighth generation. 
a National Geographic explorer, an incredible wildlife photographer, and a great friend and partner to the Nature Conservancy. He's passionate and a passionate advocate for the panther and for land conservation throughout the state of Florida. Tonight, we're going to kick off the program with a five-minute video that offers a behind-the-scenes look at the work that he's done that's featured in this magazine article, and then we'll hear from the man himself, Carlton Ward, as he'll walk us through his journey with the panther. After that, we'll enjoy what will surely be a very engaging conversation between Carlton and Execu Executive Director Temperance Morgan of TNC Florida. Temperance! You're awesome, buddy. Let's now go for a, a look at this five-minute video to talk about Carlton's work. So glad you're here, people, all of you. I, mean, I see photography as, as a window into these stories. The, the photograph, to me, is a point of inspiration. It can help inform. But, but most importantly, it can help inspire people to care and appreciate a place. And through the story of the Florida Panther, you can get people thinking and talking about conservation. And I think that's what it's all about. We're standing beneath State Road 80. This is one of the most deadly roads in the state for wildlife, especially Florida Panthers. And so here, there's an underpass which allows animals to safely cross beneath the highway. And just a mile behind us is the Caloosahatchee River, which has been that barrier to the breeding population for the past nearly 50 years. But for the first time in five decades, we have female panthers recorded on the other side of that river. And they may very well have traveled beneath this crossing. So when I got the assignment from the Nature Conservancy, I knew this was a place where we had an opportunity to tell this story. Camera battery, 54%, 7,644 shots. The ultimate shot we'd be going for would be like a panther where I'm standing with a car on the road. But being that this has been here for seven months and we've only gotten a panther two or three times, that's really low probability. For me, this was a huge challenge, like the biggest challenge of my career. In all my years, Working in wild Florida, I've only photographed a panther one time with a camera in my hands. It's extremely rare to be able to see one of these animals, and even rarer to see one in a way that you can show it in its habitat. So the camera trap is an essential tool. It's, it's the only reliable way to get a picture of a Florida panther in the wild. And it's definitely the only way to show a panther in its place on its own terms with that wide angle perspective that hopefully is awe-inspiring with the view of the animal, but also informs you about that animal's habitat and where it lives. The cameras we use are quite a bit different from the camera trap that you would buy at the hunting and outdoor store. Right the Slightly back. It's a full DSLR camera system, multiple flashes or strobes, dozens of rechargeable batteries, and systems that are in environments that are so volatile that you've got to service and check on them every two weeks. And just, just setting one up takes an entire day. I'm gonna do a test shot here. Okay. Panther time, it should get me. The reward for me is over time building a set of images that are gonna show the world the Florida Panther in a way it's never been shown before. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's working. Give it a few months, maybe? Four years? <laughs> That's how it goes out here. <laughs> The panthers are so rare, a panther was coming through that location maybe once a month. Maybe once every two months facing in the direction of the camera. Maybe only a couple times a year facing the camera in the daylight. And so to have those once or twice a year moments and have 
the infrared trigger and the camera and the flashes all operate in that instant when the panther is in that exact spot within tens of thousands of acres or millions of acres of habitat and all come together right there. You know, that, that's what I think makes that so special to me. I have a great respect for Florida Panthers, but for me, it's, it's more about what the Florida Panther represents. The Panther represents Florida's wild nature that's still here. It's largely overlooked and forgotten. And at the same time, it's so exciting and so inspiring to people who actually learn about it. To think of a state with 21 million residents, 125 million annual tourists, I think that's what makes these pictures important because if people can care about the Panther, they also can perhaps start caring about the place that we need to save. Thank you to the Nature Conservancy for putting that video together and for sending me on this journey over the past year to join in them and telling this story. It's a real privilege to be here and I'm excited about the panel discussion with Temperance where we're gonna be able to go deeper um, into some of the scenes and, and, and why we're doing this work. So I'm gonna start with a brief overview that kind of follows my journey on how I got to be uh, spending my life tending cameras and boxes uh, beneath highways in, in the Everglades. So that journey for me began a little bit further from home. I studied biology and anthropology in college and I had an amazing opportunity to work in Central and West Africa with the Smithsonian. And it, it was a period of time between 2001 and 2004 where I went to Africa nine times on expeditions and assignments. It was an amazing opportunity um, to connect with distant cultures and distant conservation issues. But every time I got on an airplane, left Florida for one month or three months, I came home to scenes like this. Um, what were once cattle ranches or orange groves or open spaces were rapidly turning into development and the story didn't seem to be being told. So I made a really purposeful transition in my career at that point to turn my lens towards my native landscapes in Florida. And that story began, or that journey began with looking at the Florida cattle ranch. I focused on ranches because it's one of these landscapes that's hidden in plain sight. It comprises nearly a fifth of our state by land mass. It's not in our state's identity and it has huge implications for water and wildlife moving forward. It's also a deeply personal story to me because I have a lot of heritage in ranching. I have cousins who are full-time cowboys still today, and this is me on a horse with my grandfather, David Ward, uh, when I was a young boy. The man in the horse here is my great-grandfather, Doral Carlton, in the summer of 1929. I never met him, but he, he was Florida's 25th governor at that time. His son, Doral Carlton III, uh, Doral Carlton Jr., the boy in the picture, I did get to know and I learned about the land through his eyes and it was a really a motivating time for me to think about someone who had told me stories of riding on horseback for two or three days at a time and not seeing a fence and to think about that transition to the Florida we know now but also the hope that his son Doyle Carlton III and his grandson Dale are still out there full-time ranchers and by being on that land, caring for that land, they're protecting it for all of us. The journey in photographing ranches opened my eyes to a lot of things, including the fact that Florida has black bears and black bears that are living almost entirely on private lands in certain parts of the state. And a biologist who I met working on a cattle ranch in Highlands County, Florida, was putting GPS collars on black bears' necks and watching the way they moved across the landscape. One bear that got a GPS collar was called M34. And this bear went on a 500 mile walkabout in two months <clears throat> in the summer of 2010, going 105 miles uh, from, from north to south and basically painting in with dots, the green space on the map, showing us that these different lands are still connected from the perspective of a wandering black bear. The bear turned around when it got up here near Orlando because the corridor he was traveling started to look like this. But the reason the bear was able to travel so widely is because of scenes like these. 
these photographs are not state parks or national parks. These are cattle ranches and orange groves, the green fabric of Florida's interior that makes it possible for this wildlife corridor to stay connected. Another big motivation for me in my journey was a study that came out in 2006 called Population 2060. The red on the map here was showing Florida's population at that point was 16 million people and projections for the year 2060. So you can see the implications for green space. The green is getting surrounded on all sides by development. But it doesn't have to be that way. Scientists from the Nature Conservancy and other organizations have been telling us for a while that we need to protect our green infrastructure. And a reserve network like this map from Reed Noss at the University of Central Florida shows that we can still tie the land together. I got involved with this nearly full time in about 2010 where I proposed a campaign called the Florida Wildlife Corridor where we could talk to the public about the need and the vision to keep the land connected. And for some reason, I, I thought it was a good idea that we should go on a 1,100 mile journey to try to show that this was possible. A little bit of an experiment with some get, I, aided by satellite imaging. In 2012, we walked for 100 days, walked and paddled 100 days, 1,000 miles on the solid red line from the Everglades to Georgia. And then in 2015, we did a similar scale journey around the Gulf Coast. But I had the amazing privilege to see Florida from the inside out, to push pull through the Everglades, to paddle uh, Lake Russell on the Nature Conservancy's Disney Wilderness Preserve not far from here, to understand that the Everglades watershed is so vast that we traveled 51 days before leaving it and the Kissimmee River and areas like this um, are so vital. Places like Avon Park Air Force Range, like Blackwater River State Forest where we have longleaf pine trees that go for dozens of miles in every direction. But through the process of these amazing expeditions, I also had a, an urge to go deeper into telling some of these stories. And that opportunity came to me in the summer of 2015 in an assignment from National Geographic Travel. I got sent to 10 parks in South Florida. One of them was Florida Panther National Wildlife Refuge. And not being a very good businessman, I took a one day assignment and turned it into a two month quest with a camera trap to try to get a picture of a Florida Panther. And the blog I wrote about the assignment was called Cooperative Bear, Frustrating Panther. <laughs> so this was August of 2015, and this female panther walking away from me, I think, has no idea the influence she's had on my life since then. Um, I became obsessed with trying to tell this story. I got a grant from the National Geographic Society and started the Path of the Panther project that sent me uh, to start work with camera traps deep in the Everglades. And this is, <laughs> kind of summarizes the first couple years of my experience. Um, those videos sum it up and make it look easy, but there's a lot of failure and a lot of frustration. And this is one spot that literally over the course of two years, um, these are my pictures. And if you're doing comparative anatomy, uh, it's, it's a great angle. A smarter photographer might have picked the other side of the log like a year into this, but I really like these aesthetics for some reason. Um, and finally, I get a cooperative bear at least, and you know, portfolio grade bear photograph, but still frustrating panther. So the, um, the Nature Conservancy helped extend my obsession because I got this uh, assignment from the Nature Conservancy. They gave me nine more months to work in this location. And uh, I got a cooperative bear again and still some frustrating panthers. But finally, during the first few months of the Nature Conservancy assignment, I got this photograph. And it made the two years of struggle worth it. And, and to walk into this place and see this image and see how many thousands, if not millions of people it's gonna reach, it's really, uh, it, it really makes it feel wor worth it looking backwards. My, my mission in this whole quest is to try to show the panther in a way that it hasn't been seen before, in a uniquely Florida way, because this is a uniquely Florida puma. And some of that involved uh, getting a little bit close to the water. Because this is one of the only places, at least in the United States, where pumas are so closely associated with water. Here I'm kind of tying my camera down so that a wandering alligator or floating log won't knock it over. But it's allowed me to create photographs 
like this to, to show the, the Florida Panther in a place that could only be Florida and, and unique to its story. Um, and also this image, which is a new one, which uh, I think is, is really going to help add voice for the cause. But it, you're seeing the highlights of, of several years. And in one location, <laughs> here the panther's always a little faster and higher than I think it's going to be. And then along came Hurricane Irma. And this is not intentionally a video. This is a time lapse of what happens when 3,000 false triggers are caused by a borderline category four storm making landfall 20 miles from your camera trap system. So we are allowed back in two months later, or two, I'm sorry, two weeks after the, after the storm came, I recovered the dead camera f uh, bobbing in the water at this point. But 3,000, you know, hidden beneath the 3,000 false triggers, I found this image. And uh, to me, it captures the resilience and beauty and perseverance of this, of this uniquely Florida animal. So the biggest, um, the biggest hope for me in this, in this journey came in November of 2016. Biologists from the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission got this picture. We'll talk more about it in the panel, but it's the first female panther north of the Clusehatchee River documented since 1973. Taking note on this map, the known breeding range of the panther and the statewide corridor, which could be the future for the panther's recovery to the north. It's a big deal to have that female north because male panthers have been there for a while. But in January of 2017, I got this photograph of that female panther. And my, my friend, at, who's the lead panther biologist for the US Fish and Wildlife Service said to me, I've been dreaming about her for 18 years. And so this embodies that hope and that opportunity. And then fast forward one more year to January of 2018, after two years of camera trapping at that spot at Babcock Ranch, I got this photo. So here, here is the hope, the resilience, the potential next generation of panthers reclaiming their historic territory. And at the same time, the development keeps coming. And we've just passed a bill for three new toll roads. It's a symptom of Florida's continuing growth and the need to try to balance because with roads and with development come increasing challenges, such as road mortalities, which we'll talk more about, the panthers we lose on the highways, but also potential solutions, such as these wildlife underpasses. And that photograph you saw in the video after multiple years of trying this approach, uh, shown, got this photograph at State Road 80. And the good thing is, what's next? What's, what's just north of this underpass is the Caloosahatchee River. So the Nature Conservancy is helping provide a path for the Panthers to get to that river and their next frontier for recovery beyond. So when I first learned about this female Panther north of the Caloosahatchee, I reached out to some of those ranchers I'd gotten to know during the previous years. One of those ranchers is a man named Kerry Lightsey. He's protected 90% of his family's land through conservation easements, starting with the Nature Conservancy. He was an early adopter back in the 1990s doing this, and he's a role model for the rest of the ranching community. He said to me, Carlton, the panther is gonna have to help us save Florida. And to hear that from a rancher with that sort of generational connection, that's become the theme of my work as a photographer ever since. And that's what we're gonna hear more about as, as um, Ferris and Temperance come up to have a deeper discussion with you. The Panther and its story can help us save Florida. Thank you. Thank you, Carlton, for that amazing uh, presentation and for all of the work that you've done. Can we, have a, can we have another round of applause for Carlton, please, in his work? Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to those of you in the room and those of you joining us on the internet. It's great to have you here. My name is Faris Bukhari. I am the Director of Strategic Communications and Marketing for the Nature Conservancy in Florida. It's a great pleasure to be here, um, and it's a great pleasure to be here with Carlton and with uh, Temperance Morgan, who is the Executive Director of the Nature Conservancy in Florida. 
I'm going to let her say a little bit more about the Nature Conservancy and our work here, and then we're going to dive into a conversation followed by some Q&A, both from our audience here in the room and our audience online. So Temperance, would you like to take it away? Sure, great, thanks, Ferris. Um, and I'd also like to thank all of you for joining us this evening. We really appreciate you being here tonight. And Gary did a great job of talking a little bit about the Nature Conservancy, so I won't repeat anything he said, but just a reminder, we're, we're a global environmental organization, and ultimately our vision is to create a world where people and nature can thrive together. And so all of the efforts in those four pillars that Gary mentioned ultimately drive at this idea of people and nature thriving together on the planet. And before we start the panel, I also want to do one more thank you. I'd like to thank Gary Jones, our board chair, and his partners at Full Sail University, as well as the amazing staff here who've, who've provided us with this tremendous venue with the best in technology, frankly, which is perfect for this experience tonight. So if you would, a round of applause. Thanks, Temperance. Um, before we get started, perhaps you can give us a quick overview of our land protection work and why the Florida panther is such an important symbol for that work. Sure, absolutely. So over the years, the Nature Conservancy has helped to protect land all across the state of Florida. We've helped protect 1.25 million, million acres of land across the state, much of which is probably in um, state and federal parks and forests that you may be familiar with. Um, we also have 80,000 acres that we own and manage that of our own land, which is also all across the state and extends from, in South Florida, the David Wachowski Key, which is a part of Key West. West, and as far north as the panhandle of Florida at our Apalachicola Bluffs and Ravines Preserve. We've acquired those properties over the years because they provide biodiversity or wildlife corridors or aquifer recharge, many of the things that, that we need these lands for. Um, the Florida panther, is, as um, Ferris mentioned, is very important not only because it's our state animal here in Florida, but also, as Carlton mentioned, it's the last remaining puma in the eastern United States. And we'll talk a little bit as we go this evening about their original range versus where they're currently located. Um, but their population is, and their range has been greatly reduced, and they're indicative of a lot of other species and the impacts that happen to them as well. But also, um, the panther is incredibly important because it's a shining example of how collaboration and conservation can bring a near extinct species back from the brink. And we'll get to cover some of how that was all possible over the course of this evening. So, as we have heard to an extent, uh, and as we'll find out more, there is historic evidence of the Florida panther and the people's effect on it since really the 1600s. Um, so perhaps, Carlton, can you talk us through some of that early history and then Temperance, maybe you can take it on from there? Great. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, the Florida panther has, has been here from the beginning and the Florida panther is a puma. It's a subspecies of the same animal that you'll see in all the way throughout North and South America, the mountain lion, the cougar. It happens to be that this is the last remnant population of pumas that survived east of the Mississippi River. With all the intensive sell European settlement in the East Coast, we wiped the pumas out of everywhere other than the far southern tip of Florida where the land was so inhospitable and wild that there wasn't that conflict with settlers. And these animals miraculously persevered all the way to this day. They only represent 5% of their original territory here in the east where they currently occupy in South Florida. Great, so as you can see, that's a huge reduction in, in range for the panther. Um, so in the 1950s, in recognition of the redu reduced population just existing in Southwest Florida, they were added, added to our Florida endangered species list. Um, in the 1960s, they were added to the federal endangered, endangered species list. And then in 1973, with the passage of the Endangered Species Act, they were among the first species that were identified for protection under the endangered, excuse me, under the endangered species act. And that really kicked off a lot of efforts to better understand the panther. So 
in um, the early 1980s, they began a radio telemetry program, much like the one you saw in Carlton's slides earlier, which allowed scientists to track their movements and better understand their behaviors in territories and actually collect blood samples, which came in handy as well. So by the mid-1980s, about 1985, based on this new data, they realized that in essence, there were probably just 20, at max, 30 panthers still living in the wild. And those 20 to 30 panthers that were still in the wild were suffering significantly from inbreeding. Um, so the scientists knew if they wanted to, to change the course, they would have to jump into action. So in the early 90s, some key scientists convened and tried to come up with a plan to improve the genetic diversity of the existing population and, in essence, replicate the historic gene flow that would have occurred amongst different subspecies of the panther historically. Um, and so based on that plan, um, in 1985, they brought in eight female pumas from Texas, um, and that was the closest yet most most distinct, um, yet still distinct, population of panthers available. So they brought eight female pumas in temporarily um, and allowed them to interact with the population in southwest Florida. And it achieved the intended results. Um, within a matter of years, um, the diversity, the genetic diversity of the population in southwest Florida had more than doubled. Um, for measures of health and um, survival, the panther had, had, oh yeah, I know, this picture gets everyone. Um, <laughs> The panther had um, rebounded. There was a lot less inbreeding seen in the population. And then that was further demonstrated that in, by 2007, we had 100 panthers in the population. So we'd went from 20 to 30 in the 80s to, two, to 100 in 2007. And today, we estimate there are probably about 200 panthers in existence today. So that population has really rebounded. We have a lot more work to do, which we'll talk about. But the efforts so far have been very successful. So it's clear from everything that you've said that encroaching communities have historically had a significant impact on the panther and its habitat. Um, can you tell us about a little bit about how current trends in development and population growth are affecting the panther even further? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll start and um, let Carlton add some color here. And as you could tell from the photography that Carlton showed, um, these are animals that need a lot of space. They need large, healthy habitats to survive. The female panther needs about 70, 75 square miles um, for her range, and the male panther needs 200 square miles for their range. So they need these large spaces. And as you saw on the slides, and as you know, living here in Florida, this is a state that has been rapidly developing for many decades. Um, and that doesn't, there seems to be no end in sight. Today, 900 to 1,000 people move to this state every day. Um, and so with more people means we need more houses, we need more food and energy, and we need more transportation corridors. And of course, all of that has the potential to um, reduce the amount of habitat and cause fragmentation. Um, and when that happens, it's harder for the panther to find prey, to find mates, and to have adequate territory. <clears throat> so those issues have been you know, affecting the panther significantly in recent years. Um, we've had a tremendous amount, as you saw on Carlton's slides, of fatalities because of vehicular collisions. Um, it is the number one um, cause of death in panthers is um, vehicular strikes. I mentioned that we have probably about 200 panthers in existence today. But to put this issue into perspective, since 2014, 202 panthers have died, have been killed, I should say specifically, and 78% of those were killed um, with, in vehicular strikes. So we're working hard to expand the population, but they're obviously still at risk um, from, from vehicular strikes, as well as when there's um, less habitat. The males um, are, you know, they are trained to defend their territory. They don't like other males in their territory. And so when there's less and less territory, what we find is the m more competition between the males, and they'll fight to the death. So as we lose habitat, we, have, we run greater risk of these vehicular um, collisions, but also of interspecies aggression amongst the panthers. I don't know if, if there's anything you'd like to add to, to that, Carlton? You covered it really well. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, 
And you mentioned the roads and the fatalities, and we heard earlier a little bit about the toll roads. I don't know if you wanted to have a quick conversation about that and speak a little about what TNC is doing there as well. Yeah, great point. Carlton mentioned the toll roads earlier. There's three toll roads being proposed across the state of Florida. Um, we had a map where you could see some of that up earlier. One of those particular toll roads is proposed from southwest Florida into central Florida, and that, in essence, is right in this prime panther habitat we're talking about tonight. Um, so the Nature Conservancy is serving on the committees for all three of those toll roads with our goal being to help provide input that can reduce impacts to habitat and fragmentation and also address other important environmental issues, thinking about impacts to our water resources, et cetera. So we're going to be very plugged in. I know that's an issue Carlton's been following very closely as well to, to do our best to um, ensure those are done in the, in the, the best way possible. I'll add on that topic that it's it's just a reminder that if we're going to have a huge public investment in our transportation infrastructure, we also need a huge public investment in our green infrastructure. And to go forward with roads without robust wildlife corridors, and not just wildlife crossings like we saw going under the roads, but you know, preferably miles wide of green space that ties all these other conservation lands together. Now is like the moment in time for Floridians to be having this conversation. And on that point, um, and in light of all these threats, what can you talk a little more about what we are doing to reduce the impacts and help save the species and maybe reference any success stories that we may have had along the way? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll kind of speak in generalities and talk about some of the Nature Conservancy's work and, and let Carlton add a little more about the corridor and the work that he's been doing. But right now, given what we've done with the genetic efforts and what have you, our focus today is really on expanding the number and the range of panthers outside of that pocket in southwest Florida where they currently find themselves. And our, our other goal is to really help reduce um, the deaths caused by vehicular strikes. And so we're working on that in a number of ways. Um, the state and federal agencies that are responsible, in this case, that's the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, they've identified um, lands that are critical for the dispersal of the panther, for them to move out of the area they're in now to get back into some of their historical range. So they've identified these critical lands and now the Nature Conservancy is helping take the lead on trying to protect the lands within, in essence, this panther corridor that has been identified. Um, and we're doing that by working with state and federal agencies and with landowners like the ones that you saw in Carlton's photographs. Um, and we're buying what he mentioned, which are conservation easements. And for those of you who aren't familiar with what that means, in essence, it means we're buying the development rights to that property, ensuring it stays in its current agricultural state and that it can continue to provide habitat for panthers and other wildlife and isn't going to be developed in the future. Um, and we are able to do those working with willing landowners and using state and federal funds as well as contributions from our donors like many of you. And that's what's made it possible for us to acquire key par Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's what um, <clears throat> has allowed us to, to buy critical parcels within that panther corridor. And specifically, if you'll indulge me for a moment, I'll talk a little bit more about some specific properties that we acquired within that corridor that, that showed up on the slides from Carlton. Um, again, with this real focus on getting the panthers across State Road 80 and across the Caloosahatchee River, trying to get females to the north side of the river. Um, starting back in 2012, we were able to acquire a key piece of property. It's called the Lone Ranger Forge property. It sits on the south side of the Caloosahatchee River at a point where the river is fairly narrow and a point where the radio telemetry had told us that the male panthers were crossing. So we knew that's a path they were using to get to the north side of the river. So we had the opportunity to acquire this parcel that was in foreclosure and was slated to go to development. Um, so we had to move very quickly, very quickly and we were able to protect this property that sits on the south side of the Caloosahatchee River but connects to the north side of State Road 80. So that was our first really important acquisition. And then we started building out from there. So in 2015, we were able to protect a property called Black Boar Ranch, which sits on the south side of State Road 80, immediately across from the Lone Ranger um, Forge property. 
So now we had a property on either side of State Road, e State Road 80 and a piece of property that butted up against the Caloosahatchee River. Then we were able in 2017 to acquire a piece of property called Cypress Creek Grove, which sits on the north side of Caloosahatchee River on that same pinch point where we knew they were crossing. So over the course of those three acquisitions, we in essence have a bit of a little mini corridor um, to get Panthers across State Road 80 and across the Caloosahatchee River. That's about 3,200 acres alone in those three acquisitions that were essential, in essence, to putting this, this corridor together. Maybe you want to talk a little bit more about the larger wildlife corridor, and then we can talk some about the crossings. Right. And I'll just add some, some personal experience, too, to those lands you just mentioned, because during that first Florida Wildlife Corridor expedition in 2012, we camped out on the banks of the Caloosahatchee River at a time when that property was still privately owned, still potentially in foreclosure, and the Nature Conservancy had not yet come in to kind of save that. And just to put some more emphasis, that was the kind of the last place where there was green space on both sides of this river where panthers would use it along its length. And so it, really a big deal and how being strategic and focused makes a statewide difference. Um, the the you know, Black Boar Ranch to the south, Cypress Creek Grove to the north, these targeted and strategic acquisitions are also coming at a time where public support for land conservation had relatively uh, fallen short. But the Nature Conservancy, in addition to encouraging sound policy, is out there getting it done themselves through their network of donors and partners, making conservation happen even when the public support has been relatively absent. And, and that means a tremendous amount because it's not far to the south where you have the Akalakuchi Slough State Forest and then the millions, literally four million acres of contiguous public land associated with Big Cypress National Preserve and Everglades National Park. So these you know, few thousand acres that you're able to save in this linkage, there's a chance for an 80,000 acre conservation easement on a cattle ranch to happen just north of that. And then next thing you know, you're tied into the 100,000 acre Avon Park Air Force range and moving up the chain and moving into that next frontier because you know, to talk numbers, we need approximately 600 panthers to have a sustainable population. And we know from those huge home ranges that that's not gonna happen south of the Caloosahatchee River. It's gonna be about getting panthers north of I-4 next and saving the Everglades headwaters and all these areas. And it's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really incredible to see the, the legacy that the Nature Conservancy has been, been able to do here. And, you know, now what's next seems that much more possible. Great, thanks for, for that. And thanks for mentioning that times were tough for some years there where federal and state dollars for these types of acqu acquisitions were really hard to come by. And on that note, that Cypress Creek Grove easement that we acquired, the third one that we acquired on the north side of the river, there weren't state and federal um, funds available at the time we wanted to move on that. So we were able to acquire that property with strictly donor funds just because of the circumstances at the time. Our goal is always to leverage as many sources of funds together to deliver the you know maximum outcome, and sometimes that's easier than others. So that during that period, things were a little tough. Um, we also, I think, we wanted to take the opportunity here to talk a little bit about wildlife crossings. You got to see the picture of those in, in Carlton's um, slides. And in essence, we learned many years ago that um, wildlife crossings could be very successful. And so the state and federal agencies and other partners like TNC and others have worked to install wildlife crossings in 60 lo locations across the state of Florida. And we know they're effective because we've been able to cite various wildlife using these particular crossings. And, and what's so great about those three properties I mentioned earlier, and you know, a property on the north side and the south side of State Road 80, was when FDOT just recently came in to expand that roadway. Because we had easements on both sides of State Road 80, we were able to work with them to ensure that that wildlife crossing that you see right there um, was installed between our two properties on State Road 80, and it was only possible because those lands were an easement and made that viable for DOT. And as you've seen from Carlton's photos, we know that it's being utilized uh, for panthers and a lot of other wildlife. That, that's a really good point that I, that I want to just touch on uh, in context. Like what, what Temperance just said is that 
it was because they had saved the land on either side of the road the DOT came in and invested in the underpass. So it's, it, it's easy to think about underpasses being the solution, but it's underpasses that are the solution within a protected lands network. And so that's, that's I think, something that we need to be talking about publicly a lot now. Um, the DOT is not gonna come in and build an underpass if the orange grove or the cattle ranch might be open for housing development at some point in the future. And so it, it's these two different solutions working together. Yeah, great point. And to that, to that note, um, we continue to work with DOT within the Panther Corridor and elsewhere in Florida to identify where it might be appropriate to, to site crossings. And if we can help with you know, the land issues around those crossings to make them possible, you know, that's our goal. And can I just mention, I don't know if you mentioned this, but uh, FDOT is the Florida Department of Transportation. Thank you. We're prone to using acronyms, and sometimes we need reminders. Um, so to just, I mean, the last part of your question was, you know, some successes that we've had so far with Panther, and we've touched on them, but to just kind of drive it home, um, it, well, it started with getting them listed as a spe endangered species so we could pay more attention to them, and then recognizing we needed to increase genetic diversity, the work of the scientists to bring in the the eight pumas from Texas was critical to really addressing um, the genetic diversity issues. <clears throat> Um, our ability to protect lands along this corridor, and to Carlton's point, not just these lands, but use these lands to connect to many other state and federally owned lands that are already in existence in the state of Florida, but are missing these critical linkage points. Um, I think we've been successful there, but we still have a lot of work to do, and we don't have all of the key pieces protected. Um, we know the wildlife crossings are working. Um, again, not the work's not done. We need to identify where more sightings would be appropriate and need to think about that in the context of the toll roads that we mentioned. And just to reinforce, I think the most exciting success that we've had in recent years was identifying a female panther on the north side of the river. And then not only that, but identifying a female on the north side of the river that we know was able to successfully breed on the north side of the river. And to the great comment that, quote, that Carlton shared earlier, for people who've worked on panther issues for their whole careers or decades, that was a very significant moment for all of us. So I think we've had some great milestones of success that keep us all excited about the possibilities going forward. So one aspect that people don't often spend much time talking about is the human element of the equation. How are people and communities integral to our work conserving and protecting panther lands? And does our land conservation work offer any positive impacts for our communities as well as wildlife? That sounds like a question for you, but I'll give you my uh, less specific answer and you can correct everything I say. No. <laughs> um, but no, it's um, th the future of the panther, the future of the cattle ranch, the future of the citrus grove, the future of hunting and fishing in interior Florida, the future of birding. These are all interconnected and in many ways the same. Like with, without that land, we will have no future for groves and no future for cattle ranches and no future for deer hunting because the fragmentation and all those effects influence every other animal too. So that's kind of my kind of non-specific non summary of that. But very true, so I will not correct him. Um. So in essence, yes, and um, these lands provide benefits for a host of other species, including other threatened and endangered species. Um, so it's not just for the panther. And to the comment that Gary made when he we introed all of this, it's also for humans. Um, we get a lot of benefits from these lands, whether it be clean air and water because of filtration and recharge, whether it be carbon sequestration or um, the continuation of ag practices that we all rely on for food to eat. Um, so they provide a lot of benefits and, and as 
Carlton kind of touched on, we have found that ranchers and farmers, frankly, are some of our best partners. Um, they love the land, they love, they've lived on the land, they know the species that are using the land, and they are oftentimes incredibly eager to work with us um, to protect those lands for future generations. Many times they don't want to see those lands developed either, and they want to know that that habitat will remain. So um, they have been tremendous partners. The Cypress uh, Creek Grove easement I mentioned earlier on the north side of the river was the first conservation easement ever done in Florida on a working citrus grove for the purpose purposes of panther protection. Um, so there are definitely some great partners out there. I mean, another great example that I like to mention, um, I think Carlton mentioned Avon Park Air Force Range in um, his original slides. And so Avon Park Air Force Range is north of the Caloosahatchee, closer to the Kissimmee River in that stretch that we're trying to get the panthers up into. Um, and so the Nature Conservancy for some years now has had a partnership with the Department of Defense a pretty unlikely uh, partner for us, um, to pr try to protect lands around the Air Force Base. So the Department of Defense interest is, they have an Air Force Base, they need to operate, and if there's too much development around it, it encroaches on their ability to do what they need to do on the base. Um, so they're able to bring Department of Defense funds to the table to try to, what they call, buffer the base. And we're able to partner with them and bring other types of conservation funds together um, to protect those lands around the base. So to your question about how does this relate between people and, and animals? Well, those types of projects provide multiple layers of benefits. Um, we're, we're, getting, uh, we're protecting our military bases and all of the things that those provide for us as, as U US citizens. We're protecting agriculture that we all need um, for food to survive. And we're providing conservation lands and all that that you know, provides in terms of wildlife corridors, water, air, et cetera. So um, these are not single purpose acquisitions. Um, all of these efforts really have multiple benefits. And did you mention at all, would you like to mention Rafter T? Ranch? Oh, yeah, sorry, I should have. So as I was talking about Avon Port... It sounds so you. sophisticated in British, doesn't it? It does. I'm going to have to work on my British accent. Um, and so, yes, thank you, Ferris, for reminding me of that. So as we've worked around the Avon Park Air Force Range just recently, we were able to close on um, the Rafter T Ranch. That's a 5,000-acre... We did it in four phases, but over the course of four phases, we were able to protect the entire Rafter T Ranch um, and get it under conservation easement as a part of that larger Avon Park Air Force Range um, effort that we have underway. Thank One you. of the amazing people I got a photograph during this assignment is Wendy Matthews from your team, and, and um, who's here. And um, does she have something to do with that? Ra does she have something to do with Rafter T? Oh, just a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Actually, this is a good time. I'm, let me just go ahead, since we talked about Wendy. I'm going to introduce her now, because she's going to be relevant when we get to the Q&A section. Wendy, if you could just stand up for a quick second. Hi, Wendy. We'll have her stand when the lights are on in a moment. But this is Wendy Matthews. You may remember her from the slide deck. And Wendy works for the Nature Conservancy and heads up all of our panther work. So frankly, we wouldn't be here talking about panthers, and I wouldn't have great things to say about what TNC has done to protect the panther if it wasn't for Wendy and all of her efforts. So not only is she key to the panther corridor, she was essential to the acquisition of Rafter T, which is what Carlton was referring to. And we're going to give her a chance to help us field some of the Q&A questions when we get to that segment shortly. So I'm sure a question on everyone's lips here is, what's next? How do we plan to continue this work towards creating a connected wildlife corridor that we've been speaking about? And most importantly, how can our audience help save the Florida panther and Florida? Well, I'm, I'd like to start, and then I'll let Carlton add some, and then I'll come back to the question about what, how everyone else can help. Um, so in terms of what the Nature Conservancy is focused on, um, we're going to continue to try to protect critical lands for wildlife across the state of Florida. And through that wildlife corridor that you um, saw Carl Carlton show up on the screen, we're going to be particularly focused now on protecting lands on the north side of the Caloosahatchee River so we can continue now that they have a way to get across the river so we can continue to connect that up to those other lands that are already protected um, north, north of the river. Um, we're going to continue our work with DO, the Department of Transportation, 
because I'm a fast learner, um, with the Department of Transportation on siting wildlife crossing, so those conversations um, continue. And I mentioned that we are plugged into each of the toll road corridor committee, so we're gonna be there trying to make sure we provide good science um, and good input into the process to try to minimize the impacts of the toll roads. My, my answer will follow from that with kind of an aspirational answer, but um, you know, from my, my knowledge of the Florida Wildlife Corridor, it's, it's 17 million acres of you know, nearly half the state of Florida identified as this wildlife corridor network. Thankfully, 60% of that land is already protected, so the 40% that are gaps or missing links, it's we, we don't necessarily need to protect all of it, but there's still substan substantial work to be done. Um, you know, through my work with National Geographic Society, I've come to learn of some really cool global partnerships, and one where National Geographic and the Nature Conservancy are the two main partners on it. It's, it's called the Campaign for Nature. And there's a global benchmark that's gonna be emerging to protect 30% of the planet by the year 2030. Only 15% of the planet globally is protected now, as far as I know. Situated within that, in the idea that we need to save half the planet, or 50%, by the year 2050, or that's the goal. Well, Florida is, according to how you count it, you know, almost there, 27, 28% protected. So if we can protect another 800,000 or a million acres to be um, aggressive in the next decade, you know, we're on a global conservation leadership path, which is, which is super cool and super exciting that we can potentially be part of that. And how can our audience be a part of that success? Well, that's actually, it was a great segue. So um, one of the things that you can do um, is support land acquisition and um, management programs at the state and federal level. So uh, Florida Forever, which is a state program that has allowed us to acquire a lot of the lands that we've been talking about tonight. Um, the Rural and Family Lands Easement Program allows us to acquire easements on agricultural properties with state funds. Um, at the federal level, it's the Florida, the, I'm sorry, not the Florida, at the federal level, it's the Farm Bill um, or the Land and Water Conservation Fund. These are all important vehicles to bring funding for land acquisition and management um, to help protect these properties. Um, I would say also, because of all the t conversation around development, um, advocating for smart growth and, and thoughtful land use practices as our state continues to develop, which we know it will, but let's do that as thoughtfully as we can. So being involved in those and those conversations, obviously staying abreast of conservation issues, um, voting for the environment, speaking out to your elected officials on these issues to let them know how you feel about it. Um, obviously, you can also help support our work at the Nature Conservancy um, in your magazines, which there's gonna be a stack of magazines everyone can grab on the way out the door. Um, there's an envelope in it that um, will allow you to become a member of the Nature Conservancy. You can help support our work and you can find out about a lot of the other work we do beyond just the Panthers. Um, there we go. Um, on the screen and out in the lobby is a QR code for you high-tech folk. Um, you can, or, or less so, because this is pretty easy, you can use your phone and take a picture with your camera, like you would take a picture of anything on, with this QR code, and it will take you to the form where you can sign up to become a member or donate. So there's a few different ways um, to, to support our work so we can continue to do this. And then the last plea I'll make, and I'll see if Carlton has any others, is the Nature Conservancy is going to be launching a new program in the Orlando metro area this year so that we have more resources available to really focus on the issues in Central Florida, including some of the development issues that we've touched on. And so you'll be hearing more from us on that program as we launch it, and we would certainly love your support and, and, and input and involvement as we focus more on your local region here in Central Florida. And can I just say, before Carlton uh, chips in with his ideas, that this is probably the only time that taking your phone out and starting to use it during a panel discussion is not rude. So please feel free to take your phones out, point it at the screen, and use that QR code. Sorry. Ferris, there's one other way right. that we can help. How's that, Gary? One of your invited guests wanted you to have this. Wow. It's our first gift. I should use it using my mic. This is a $10,000 check in support of our panel. Amazing. 
Thank you, Gary. This man works fast. And this is a gift from, from one of his neighbors because Pan, uh, Gary seems to have um, a powerful impact on those he interacts with because of his passion for these issues. So thanks so much, Gary. That is a great way to kick off this event. And Carlton will let you add your parting thoughts. My parting thoughts are um, please share this story. You know, we, we um, in the communications team, in, you know, as on assignment and so forth, has you know, put a year's worth of time into photographing and documenting and putting this magazine issue together. It's, um, it's a distillation of a lot of different stories that we've talked about today. And in addition to the 100,000 households who will get this uh, in the mail, it's also online. And in addition to the main magazine story about the Panther's Path, there are several blogs and videos and other resources. So please go to nature.org and use this story to you know, share it to your neighbors. You know, maybe they're not all gonna write a $10,000 check, but we need all of them to understand that Florida's state animal, uh, you know, what it is, what it looks like, the land it needs, and most importantly, how that animal can help us save our state. And, and the story's there, the maps are there, it's all together, and so please uh, add your voice to helping share that. Or maybe they will write a $10,000 check, who knows? Those are, those are good neighbors to have. Well, thank you both again. Uh, I know you just applauded, but maybe another round of applause for Carlton and Temperance to finish us off. When you go outside, once we've finished our Q&As, you will all be able to take home one of our magazines. Um, and you can also share the link once it's up to the video of this panel discussion. So if you wish you had friends here who you think would really enjoy this conversation, you'll be able to go to our Facebook page and click on the link and see this panel discussion at any time in the future. So keep your eye out for that. Um, we have run a little bit over, so we're going to keep our Q&A a little bit shorter than expected. We have probably some online questions as well. There are some people wandering around with mics. For those of you who have, who have questions, I will ask you to keep your questions brief um, so that we can spend the majority of the time answering those questions for you. So do we have any questions to kick us off? The gentleman here at the front. Thank you. Um, There's a mic coming your way. Sorry, this gentleman right at the, fr the front line here, right in the center. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Scott Taylor. Um, you've talked, Constance, you talked about funding, and I'm, I'm very interested to find out uh, TNC's uh, work as it relates to uh, the failure of our legislature to properly share as was intended in the 2014, uh, it was Amendment 1, now the Water and Legacy Act, uh, of not fully funding Florida Forever, a great source of funds that used to be some $300 million a year, and I think this year we might get 25 or 40, something like that. Is TNC involved in, um, in applying the legislature, in trying to apply them? I know, I, I know we have been trying ourselves. I'm just interested to know what your efforts have been in that regard. Yeah, of course, since the passage of Amendment 1, we have um, been in Tallahassee sharing our opinions on where we think those funds should go to the many critical conservation priorities we have across the state, um, from the types of lands we've talked about tonight to some protection that we need for some of our criti critical water resources across the state. So, you know, we, keep, we, we continue to make the case um, that we need to focus those limited funds on the purposes for which they're intended because, frankly, even those limited funds are not enough to, to do what we need to do, but we need to make sure they're you know, laser focused on these issues. And so every year, including this year, we're gonna be in Tallahassee. We take our trustees, our board members up to Tallahassee, and we advocate for more funding for Florida Forever and the Rural and um, Family Lands Program. And for the management of these lands, it's not just about acquiring them, but making sure you manage them so they can provide the habitat they're intended. So we're gonna keep pushing that and hope that those funds continue to line up the way that they're, they should. And I think there was a question towards the back as well. <clears throat> this is a two-part question. What, are they, what do panthers eat? And the second part is, 
I'm assuming that they eat small game deer and their habitat is being invaded by pythons, which eat similar types of things. Is that impacting the saving of the Florida panther? And how is Nature Conservancy working with whoever is trying to stop the invasion of pythons? I can answer the first part. Um, Panthers preferred prey item over this over the millennia is, would be white-tailed deer. That's what they're really evolved to hunt. They have also been supplemented by wild hogs that have been a um, kind of co-benefit of the Spanish. Um, and uh, but they'll 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 eat anything that uh, you know a pretty wide meat-based diet. The issue with the pythons is um, a little bit peripheral because. Um, there's not a lot of panthers out in Everglades National Park. They prefer uplands. I mean, I think a Florida panther would rather be in um, in Orlando or Ocala National Forest than in every, than in the deep Fakahatchee. But it's just all the land that we gave them. So in those areas where um, they might be putting a den on a tree island, where a where a, a python might threaten their kittens or eat the small prey, there is some conflict, but, but largely, thankfully to this point, the, um, the geographies don't fully overlap. Keep the pythons down there, hopefully. Yeah, and let the panthers eat all the feral hogs because they're a big problem. Um, but to your question about the Nature Conservancy's involvement in the, py the python issue, um, we have been involved. We actually, in the early days of recognizing we had a big python problem here in Florida, the, Nature Conser the Florida chapter of the Nature Conservancy established what's called the Python Patrol, which was the original program to train people to go out and locate um, and bring those snakes in so they're not outbreeding um, in the wild. We've since passed that program off to other agencies who are better positioned to continue it, um, but we started it because we knew um, that they could start having impacts on a lot of uh, species that other important species rely on for food. So to your point, we are losing a lot of birds and other small prey that some of our larger predators in Florida um, rely, rely on as part of their food base. Thank you. And uh, do we have any questions online? We can go to an online question if we have any. Rachel? Nothing at the moment? Okay. The lady here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I noticed that um, the southern part of Florida uh, was very much uh, protected for these wonderful animals. And yet, uh, recently, the majority of scientists are talking about the disappearance of half the state of Florida within the next 20, 30 years, and what can be done about that? Yeah, great question. So she's talking about concerns around sea level rise, um, which you know creates the potential for portions of Florida to become inundated. And it depends on which projection you look at as to the magnitude of that. But in any event, um, we know some of that will be happening. Um, so Everglades restoration is underway in an attempt to try to mitigate some of that by getting more fresh water down in th into the Everglades in the system to try to slow down the you know the increasing sea level rise. Um, <clears throat> But the bottom line is that's obviously a challenge. And, and the Nature Conservancy is focusing on providing corridors that will allow species to migrate. Um, we've done a lot of science that shows that the species, if they have a place to move to and they have comparable habitat, that they, they will move out of harm's way. And so we've done extensive science that we're using, frankly, all across North America to identify what we call climate resilience corridors, um, where we believe wildlife are going to use to migrate. And so we're trying to protect those corridors and to the best of our ability, ensure that ultimately there'll be similar habitat, maybe in a different location, um, that can provide for these critical species. And we better do it a little bit soon because the, the two-legged species might be wanting to move to those exact same areas. So uh, the, the, the urgency of getting these wildlife corridors protected is kind of enhanced by what's going on with climate change. Yeah, ever increasing. Any other questions? I believe there's a lady there at the back. Is, is the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service currently reviewing the endangered status of the Florida panther? This might be a question for Wendy, not to give you a hardball, Wendy, but do you know if that's under um, 
evaluation I'll, I'll, at this time? Uh, yes, they've been working on that um, update to the uh, recovery plan and, and the um, report for probably nearly two years now. And uh, we had expected to hear something by now, but I, I believe that they're um, going to be releasing some information soon on that, but nothing to date. And since I don't have to uh, be a scientist, I can give my opinion uh, on this topic. Um, you know, I think whatever they come up with, I mean, it can have some ramifications for legal protections, but it's really a lot of semantics um, because what makes the Florida Panther absolutely special and unique is that it's in Florida. You know, whether it's 99% related to the one in Texas or 98, like the fact is it's a puma living in Florida that deserves special protections as the last puma in the Eastern United States. So I think, um, you know, my hope is that whatever the technical classification is, we'll focus on that unique heritage, that unique quality. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi. Hi, oh. Ferris, it's Rachel from oh, the Oh, hi, back. Rachel. Hi, Carl Gillard from our online audience is asking, what can the average Floridian do to help? Good question, Carl. Temperance, would you like to answer that? Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll touch on a few of the things I mentioned earlier. So um, helping to support land acquisition and, and management um, funds at the state and federal level, getting really involved in decisions around development in your, in your region. Um, so that can be at, at the local level or at the regional level. Um, that's where a lot of these decisions around where um, houses are going and where roadways are going is being decided. So getting involved in those issues like I said earlier, letting your elected officials know these issues matter to them. They care about what's on their constituency's mind. And if they know it's the environment, that's going to weigh in their decision making. If they think people don't care about the environment, that's going to weigh in their decision making. So um, staying plugged in and raising your voice with elected officials. And then, as I said, um, you know, supporting our work. We, we can use all the help we can get in the form of donations as, as well as, you know, some volunteer help or advocacy help on these issues. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that the average person can get involved in these issues. Anything to add there, Carlton? She did it well. <laughs> if I can add one last thing, it's also to, as we mentioned before, raise awareness. So if you are interested enough to see this panel discussion, be interested in the, in the topic, bring it up with your friends, bring it up with your family. The more people know about it, the more people could potentially act to help. And again, you know, going back to something that Temperance mentioned earlier, a lot of these tracts of land that we were able to protect, we were able to protect because of donor support, because of the public support. And that is a really important thing for us to, to work towards always. Do we have any other questions here in the room? There's, there's a lady and a gentleman Hi, here. In the third, fourth row. Is the microphone not working? It's not working. Hello. I'm just curious, would you elaborate a little bit on how development can be um, more green and, and do their part? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's a number of ways that it can happen. Um, and some, you know, sometimes it's about siting, where we choose to site development. Um, we can pick spots where it's more conducive to development and has less impacts on species, like if it's in the critical part of a corridor. Um, the other things that can be done is ensuring that there's a lot of green space built into developments. Um, so as consumers, um, you know, developers are driven by consumer interest, right? So as consumers, if we're interested in being, living in places where they've protected habitat, where they have green spaces, that's going to mean more developers are, are constructing with that in mind. Um, and so that's another way that, from a development standpoint, we can try to minimize um, selecting places where we're going to have these kind of impacts. I don't know if there's anything you would add. I do think it's maybe worth mentioning that that first female panther documented north of the Caloosahatchee River since 1973 set up her home range on Babcock Ranch State Preserve. And if you know the history of that development, that was a 98,000 acre contiguous cattle ranch. And when that 
property was proposed for sale and for development. It was a hybrid conservation and development deal. There's a, a new city called Babcock Ranch going in with 19,000 homes on 17,000 acres. But that city is going on less than 20% of that land and it's clustered in the southwest corner of that land. So actually, that city enabled the preservation of 75,000 acres that ended up providing the home range for the first female panther north of the river. So it's a scenario where development and conservation work together. A couple things I'll mention about that model though, it, it required public support to make it happen. So it's not 100% on the developer to figure out a way to save 80% of their land. Jeb Bush at the time spent $300 million in addition to whatever was being spent on Florida Forever that year to make the math work, to make that $800 million property viable for higher density development and very significant conservation. Yeah, that's, I should have thought of that. That is a, a great example of a kind of forward-thinking developer who was willing to set aside a good chunk of the property so it could be used for a working ranch and for conservation, uh, giving them, as Carlton said, that higher density on the other piece of the property. And from my perspective, and hopefully from a growing consumer perspective, it sure is nice to live in a development that's surrounded by a lot of natural areas and wildlife. Um, so you know, there's a win-win there if we can get people to think you know, more creatively about development models. And I think we can take one more question. There's a gentleman in the red jumper there, um, and then we will wrap it up. Thank you. Actually, that was uh, that was quite good because, like you say, we do like to have uh, integrated uh, wildlife with the areas that are developed, and uh, that takes planning. So you have to uh, strategically plan for that. And uh, I kind of uh, it's a little bit elusive to see if there is a plan. I don't see anybody else that would do that, frankly, except the Nature Conservancy as the integrator. Uh, of all the various departments and organizations that will participate in that. The uh, panther is actually an excellent example of uh, a way uh, to get to that. Since it is the umbrella species, it does, uh, and it covers, I mean, my goodness, from South Florida all the way to Central Florida, that's an enormous uh, land area to be concerned with. So uh, you showed you know, some of the areas that are uh, protected, that are under development, that would like to be um, uh, future protection for all of that. So that's really wonderful. But is there a plan that applies to the entire state? Is there a strategic land plan that says if we were, to, if we were able to protect, conserve, uh, manage these areas, that this is really our goal, this is really our strategy. Carlton actually had a slide in his, uh, in his uh, deck there that uh, went by pretty quickly, I thought, um, that kind of showed that. So my question is, was that slide really the goal and the strategic plan of the areas uh, that we said if we could uh, manage these, that this would be a great way to integrate the developed areas and the uh, wildlife uh, areas of the state. I, I'm not sure if that's clear. No, very, very clear. So Thank I would you. say, um, yes, the conservation community has a pretty good vision for where, how we think um, developed lands and natural lands could be interspersed across the state of Florida. Uh, the Nature Conservancy's kind of had a rule of thumb that we'd like to see 30% of the land in Florida protected in conservation, 30% of the land in what we call working land, so timber and ranching and some of these um, ag lands that can provide habitat, and then 30% of the state in, in development. Um, so that's kind of been our rule of thumb that we share with anyone who will listen. Um, and that we've been pushing toward through our acquisitions. To your other point about, you know, thinking about development statewide, I would love to say that we had a statewide, you know, development and growth plan from 
state government. Um, that's not the case. We used to have fairly robust, comprehensive planning and zoning um, requirements at the state level here in Florida. Um, we don't have so much of that anymore. And so one of the things that's a focus for us in the coming years and is a big part of our street strategic plan and priorities is trying to work to get some of that back in place. It may look a little different, but trying to think about the maps that we've come up with where we know we need to protect critical lands and other places that are that are more viable for development and try to work with the state um, to either come up with a statewide plan or bring back some of those uh, regulations that helped us look at these issues more comprehensively. Well, with that, thank you again to Carlton and Temperance for indulging us with the questions and with the great discussion. Uh, a round of applause, I think, is due for both of them. And thank you to all of you for coming out tonight for supporting the Nature Conservancy and the work that we're doing to protect the Florida panther. Thanks to everyone who was watching online. We hope you enjoyed this. Uh, as I said, this will be available online um, in the future on Facebook. Please stick around, grab a drink, uh, have a bite to eat, find the Nature Conservancy staff that are going to be mingling around and chat with them. And don't forget that outside there's going to be giveaway tables that will have uh, some magazines for you all to take home, as well as some other goodies. So thank you all for coming. Thank you to Gary and to Full Sail again for your generosity and for your hospitality. Have a good evening.